This is Marlene, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Whether you're watching a video or listening to a podcast, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. Links to videos or MP3 files can be found on MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Go to MarlenePardo.com for information on new book releases. I narrate several podcast series that can be found on major podcast platforms and can also be listened to via Alexa, Sonos, and other home systems. Look for Supernatural Storytime for scary storytelling, Nightshade Diary for classic horror and adventure stories, Stories of the Supernatural for interviews with different guests on the show. If you want to get noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit Strange Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com or find us on Blogspot. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Stories of the Supernatural. How's everybody doing? I know the show is a little bit staggered, but happy 2022, everybody. Um, a lot of crazy stuff. <laughs> a lot of crazy stuff. But you know what? Like I tell, I'm always an optimist. And I always, uh, besides looking for the, the silver lining, I always expect good things to happen. So um, that's what I'm expecting overall for 2022 to be in I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that are going, yeah, Marlene, yay. So anyway, um, first of all, I want to remind you guys, please sign up for my newsletter. Okay, you can go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, MarlenePardo.com. Sign up for my newsletter. It only goes out once a week. And I usually write a short, weird, unusual article. Usually it goes stories, sometimes uh, historical mystery, you know, something like that. Uh, and on there, I put related videos or podcasts. And I also make announcements of any of the releases of my new books. Um, like back in September, I had a had 100 book giveaway on Goodreads, which is through Amazon. I, I announced it on that. Um, anything of that nature, if I'm going to have a live stream like I did for Halloween. And I, and I did one also for New Year's Eve. I announced it on, the, uh, on my newsletter. So like I said, once a week. Sign up for my newsletter, MiamiGhostChronicles.com or MarlenePardo.com. Um, a lot of, uh, I'm going to just let you know, <clears throat> because finally, what, it's taken me a whole year to settle into North Florida. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start going out now because, um, you know, I, be I work with FindAGrave.com and I've been working with them for many years and there's a lot of older historical cemeteries and people will put in their request for photographs of certain graves. So sometimes I'll go out there and upload them because people have put in the request for, you know, a picture. A lot of them, a lot of genealogists work with that, you know, or personal, they're, they're trying to track down a family member. But my point being that along the way, I'm going to be doing cemetery runs. I'm going to be doing, there's a lot of very old smaller cemeteries here and you go down these roads and you turn and all of a sudden you've got the cemetery there and you can tell I could I could I'm already good at this you can already tell by some of the monuments there that it's quite old so and I know a lot of people had told me had asked me you were you used to go to a lot of cemetery runs before when are you going to start doing it I'm going to start doing it and there's a lot of uh, not only um, historical but a lot of them have some very unusual stories and supposed hauntings attached to them, all right, which I will do the research and we'll find out, is there anything there? You know, uh, I'll probably take some type of small ovulus just to see if we pick everything up, but more than anything, <clears throat> what everybody tells me they enjoy is like the historical content, because usually I do say, you know, I talk about how old, who were the founding families, what's the background of the area, et cetera, et cetera. I'll make it interesting, or at least I'll try. And I'm not even going to talk about my chickens because I know some some of you are like, what? Okay, let me tell you real quick. Uh, like everybody knows, I have a lot of young roosters running a lot around, which have been sent out, you know, to the perimeter of the coop by the older roosters. And um, they're, they're usually the last to roost the other day I had three of them. Usually they'll like spar a little bit and everybody walks away. You know, they're just showing up. 
The other day I had two of my, I have a big red one and he got two of these young roosters and one of them especially bloodied them up bad. And it didn't happen while I was here because normally I would go up there and, you know, break it up. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, I've got one of my young roosters. He's in, uh, and, and what's really funny is after they had the fight, and when that red one saw him, he would chase him off and come right after him. He was like, and he had this got a big giant hole in the back of his head. Yeah. So anyway, let's get back to the paranormal stuff. <laughs> Anybody that wants to know what's happening in Chicken Kingdom, that's what's happening in Chicken Kingdom. Now, let's get on to the good part, which is who I have for a guest. This gentleman has been here before, but it's been a few years. His name is Mike Ricksecker. And he is the author of the Amazon bestselling A Walk in the Shadows, A Complete Guide to Shadow People. Uh, he's also authored eight historic paranormal books and the esoteric tome, Alaska's Mysterious Triangle. He has appeared on multiple television shows and programs as a paranormal historian, including Travel Channels, The Alaska Triangle, Discovery Plus's Fright Club, Animal Planets, The Haunted, Bio Channels, My Ghost Story, and Ren TV's, which is to Russia, Mysteries of Mankind. Mike also produces his own internet supernatural-based shows on the Haunted Road Media YouTube channel and is the producer and director of the docuseries, The Shadow Dimension, available on several streaming platforms. On Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, he hosts the Edge of the Rabbit Hole live stream show and the Connecting Universe Interactive class, respectively. Haunted Road Media is also his own paranormal and supernatural book publishing and video production company, representing a number of paranormal authors, winning the award for excellent media, in the paranormal field at the 2019 Shockfest Film Festival. Mike's historic paranormal articles have been published in the Baltimore Sun, Paranormal Underground Magazine, and he previously wrote an Oklahoma City paranormal column for Examiner from 2010 to 2014. His work has also been featured in the Oklahoman, the Frederick News Post, Marshall University's The Parthenon, and Louisiana State University's Civil War Book Review. He now hosts Many of these articles, along with informational videos and learning courses on the Connected Universe Portal website. He's a native of Cleveland. He's also a U.S. Air Force veteran with a degree in simulation programming and is an avid baseball fan. Help me welcome him back. How are you doing tonight, Rick? I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> doing pretty well. Oh, yeah, really. How are you? <laughs> sorry. Good. I, you I'm know, doing pretty well, thanks. I know everybody... I know because most of my audience knows I always ask my guests, how did you get interested in the paranormal? But I'll bring everybody up to speed unless you want to tell a story that you had an encounter as a kid with all things a shadow person. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell the story. Yes. You know, my first significant paranormal experience, you know, I was about uh, about eight years old and woke up in the middle of my or woke up in the middle of the night in my bedroom and uh, in the corner was this tall, dark figure you know i had no idea that it was a shadow person or anything uh at that time you know i was just a kid i i thought it was an intruder that was in the house and it was about to kill me that's about wow. what you think at that age um mm -hmm. you know i was very scared of course uh, and of course i'm still allowed to tell the tale which is which is great <laughs> but um it did something really unusual so i'm trying to scream nothing's coming out of my mouth because i'm just too terrified it came up to my bed leans over i'm looking up into <laughs> oh this God. blank black face there's just nothing there and uh, it grabbed me by the wrists crossed my arms across my body and then it ran off down the hall and of all places into a closet so i found my voice found my legs ran off screaming to my parents bedroom uh, you know they they tried to console me told me that i just had a bad dream but i knew i'd been awake for this whole thing <laughs> yeah it's like yeah. Man, let me tell you something. That scene is right out of a horror movie. Let me tell you. God. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. That's for sure. <laughs> that, that is like, in, in you, did you ever have an encounter with this shadow person or shadow man again? Well, not that specific one. I've had a lot of uh, encounters with shadow entities over the years, but uh, that particular shadow entity was only just that one time. And in that house, I would never call a haunted house either. That's like... Um, I mean, there may have been one other paranormal experience that I had there and I was even younger. So it's kind of harder to remember if it was mm -hmm. real or something else. Um, and I lived there for 10 years, but that was like the, the big thing that happened there. And that was the reason like, why so I asked is I've house. heard of people that have kids have those encounters, but they, they, it's almost like they get targeted. Like it's repetitive and they're like, Oh my God, you know, 
so I guess if you yeah, want you know, to call when, it lucky. Yeah, yeah, maybe lucky was just a it was just a one off. Um, the the one when I uh, when I moved, we moved into a house after that. Uh, we moved from Massachusetts to Ohio, and in that house that I moved into, uh, you know, I did repeatedly see the same uh, shadow person. I over and over for several months, you know, it eventually wow. subsided and ended, but you know, this one was, you know, I'm unpacking boxes, putting things away just after we first moved in. And I kept seeing this shadowy, more translucent type of a figure standing in the doorway of my, of my bedroom. And whenever I turn and look at it, it would just, you know, go running off. And, uh, you know, this happened over the course of, of several days to start with before I asked, you know, my mom, okay, and I was like 13 at the time, so I was a little bit older. Uh, and I told her, I, I keep seeing this thing standing in my doorway. And I described the whole thing. And she actually said that she had seen the same thing. So it was, you know, great for me because it's like, okay, affirming what I had seen. She didn't, you know, she didn't think I was crazy. I'm not crazy. Um, but she was really nonchalant about it. So, <laughs> you know, I I ended up getting playful with this thing. I called him Tom, like peeping Tom, because he'd always peep in my bedroom. And so wow. I'd, I'd be doing something and I'd see him saying there, hi, Tom. And he'd, he'd go running off and yeah. <laughs> that's incredible so do you let me ask you do you think i don't know because do you because you hear these stories about shadow people and that the feeling that people usually get from them is like very sinister or threatening but it almost sounds like this wasn't the, the prototypical shadow person maybe do you think it was an intelligent haunting well, of somebody that couldn't just come in all the way. Yeah. The, the, the idea of, well, and, and that happens where, you know, some of these uh, shadowy entities are just human spirits that can't mm-hmm. fully manifest. And that may be what this thing was. Um, and the, and there's kind of a misnomer in that, you know, all these shadow entities are dark, evil, sinister, that sort of thing. Some of them certainly are, um, but they are a lot of different things. And, you know, people ask me, okay, so, you know, what is a shadow person? And that's just like opening up a can of worms because they can be so many different things. They can be a human spirit like that. You know, they can be an interdimensional being. They can be an ET. They can be an extraterrestrial. Um, sure, some of them can can be demonic. Others can be actually light beings that our eyes can't see a, a certain, uh, that just can't see correctly. They could be astral projections. They can be a lot of different things. So it's not just a one and done. This is what a shadow person is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so there are, there are some that, yeah, they're just, they're just a human spirit kind of passing through. They, maybe they lived at that location and they're just there and that's how they're able to manifest. Right. And then you hear, of course, what they call like the hat, because I've heard of shadow people that are hooded. Then you hear the yep. other ones that have a hat of some type. I've heard top hat, cowboy hat, hat. Uh, but they have that same thing where it's very dark and you really don't see any features, in other words. Yeah, it's like um, a silhouette. Yeah, you get a lot of the different style hats. It could, you know, it could be a fedora, top hat. I've heard one tale of like an archer hat, like something out of Robin Hood, which oh, really? is really bizarre. Yeah, so a lot of different styles. I know that. And to me, I because I've heard of people, and I'm thinking, you know, if, of all the weird things that you would say, if anybody was going to, let's say, make up a story, it's like you put a hat on 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 a thing. It's And, and I have spoken directly to people, and this was many years ago, this you know, these stories about shadow people and hat man and all this have become more common maybe in the last 20, 15 years. But back in the 1980s, I had a conversation with a co-worker who she told me she saw a shadow man with a top hat. And this was back in the 80s. And I remember yeah. I was like, a guy with a top hat? I was like, that's weird. In her apartment, you know, she had, she was a young teenager. She woke up and he was at the foot of her bed. And many, many, many years later is when I was like, man, that story as she told me way back then, I hear other people saying the exact same thing. Yeah, it's you know? um, it, it's not that it didn't happen back then. I mean, we, yeah, you're hearing more stories these days, right? You know, for for a number of different reasons. You know, over the last 20, 25 years, you know, we've had it. It, it started with you know the internet where people were you know connecting oh, yeah. and sharing stories, and hey, I had this experience. You know, I. I was in a, a smaller town my in my later years when my interest in this phenomenon really started to grow. So there weren't a lot of people to talk to. The library didn't have a lot of books. Where could you possibly go? Then, you know, mid-90s really is when the, the World Wide Web 
you know, started to take mm-hmm. off and, um, you know, you start connecting on different forums and bulletin boards, Yahoo groups, you know, places like that, you know, find that, Hey, there are other people that have had these experiences. You start sharing these stories like that. And then, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, that's when you started seeing the paranormal television shows start to come out, uh, which, yes. you know, I think was great because then people realized, Hey, you know, it, it's becoming more mainstream. I've, I've had these experiences too. I'm not alone. And it helped people to become more comfortable sharing their experiences and their stories. And so, um, you know, cause I'll also get that question is, is this activity happening more? Cause you're hearing more and more reports. It's like, well, you know, it, people have become more comfortable telling their stories because it's, it used to be so taboo to talk about right. this thing or, uh, you know, people would think you were crazy. They might even throw you mm-hmm. in a, you know, put you in a straight jacket and throw you in a, a mental yeah. institution that happened to people. Uh, but you don't really have that fear so much anymore. Now it's, now it's kind of in vogue. Yeah. Well, and see, this is the thing I tell if even those early shows in the nineties, was in search of and all these, a lot of times they also did like historical homes or historical properties mm-hmm. that had, you know, the revolutionary war. It's like, as we went into the reality shows that people started actually talking about their own personal, you know, firsthand ghost encounters, like you said, because the stigma was not as bad anymore that you could actually say, you know what, like with the story you just said, when I was growing up, I lived in this house and for years I was having these experience and this is what it was. You know, some of it, like you said, is uh, it's not really scary. It's just like a little bit weird. And then other people talk about uh, like, man, by the time I turned 18, I left home because I couldn't take it anymore because there was so much activity going on in my house that uh, I couldn't take it. And I, you know, you, you know, you hear a lot of these, like you said, people are sharing more of their uh, and it's like now it's the worst. It's like you said, it's in vogue and it's like, oh, so you're one of those two, huh? <laughs> so, everybody, yeah you know, and i know a lot of people even if they haven't seen it they do believe that there is such a thing as life after death or ghosts etc there is that oh, yeah, absolutely it. yeah I, I think you have more more people than not that actually do believe in it yes yes even if they have not seen it um they they kind of and even the ones i think sometimes are very skeptical they, ah, i don't believe it i'm like yeah you just say that really if i say it enough well, my, then <laughs> it yeah, won't happen yeah, my 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 dad is like that. You know, he's like, I don't believe in any of that stuff. But there was this one time and he'll launch into this story. And it's like, dad, that's a yeah. ghost story. You had, a, yeah. you had a supernatural experience. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, exactly. I have an aunt that's just like that. You talk to her and she's like, oh, that's, that's BS and blah, blah, blah. And like a few years ago, the family, she started telling the story about when she was a kid, she saw ghosts. And I was like, I looked at her and I like, you saw she looked at me, oh, no. I go, but that was that's a that was a ghost, you know that was. And then she was one of those, well, we won't talk about that anymore. It's like, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I know that a lot of people that the 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 more the more the harder they they protest, you know, what is it? Thou protest too loudly or something like that. Right, exactly. Uh, and anyway, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, I know that you've been doing that show uh as far as Alaska, and and we were commenting right before we started to record that um i mean you always hear these things about alaska but a lot of weird things happen in alaska just by yeah. itself they have a lot of besides the disappearances i didn't realize that there were have so many i don't want to say cryptids but stories of weird beings yeah you know? there's a lot of stuff going on in alaska you mentioned the disappearances Sixteen thousand people since 1988 which is a lot, a lot especially yeah, especially considering how sparsely populated the state is. Um, and, and sure, some of those are people that just, you know, wandered off the path somewhere yeah. and got eaten by a bear. That that happens. Or people that wanted to get lost. That happens yes. too. But it's an inordinate amount of people that just, I mean, you know, one of the stories is that uh, it was the, the Mount Marathon race. And, you know, the guy ran up the hill and he just never came back down and never found him. Yeah, I was like, where did he so, go? <laughs> that's a, I had not heard that. I mean, I've heard of these people, you know, that disappear, like you said, you know, the the four women are missing, the, all these people that go into the national parks. But I had never heard of somebody doing a race, and it's just where do you go? Yeah, poof, gone. Yeah, it's it's bizarre, and and like you said, the uh, the the cryptid encounters that they have up there, you know, between you know, you have a lot of different Sasquatch type 
uh, right. beings that are up there. You know, Bigfoot. You have what they call the hairy man, which is another type. The uh, the, the Alaskan Bushmen. So all these different types. It's a uh, Kshataka, which is the uh, the otter man. Uh, so he's kind of almost like half man, half otter sort of thing, which is one mm-hmm. of the um, the old native legends. Right. You have the lake, the Lake Iliamna uh, lake monster, which is kind of like their Loch Ness monster. Uh, so you have a lot of these different what uh, creatures is, um, up there. Have you heard of this guy? There's a town. I want to say it's in Alaska. It's called was it Portluck or Portlock, something? Yeah, yeah. It's two that, different names: Portlock or Port Chatham. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. And um, I had heard about it, and then I looked into it, and I think it was what it, I think they had a cannery uh, on there. That's yeah. just like the little village. And from yeah. what I understand, they they had, were getting attacked. They they had a Bigfoot supposedly was attacking some of the people that lived there. I mean, it was a small place, but it was like wow, that's unusual. Yeah, that was the uh, that was the Port Chatham Harry Man. So yes. Uh, they were- yeah, you didn't want to venture out into the into the woods too far because he would get you. And they would find these like severed limbs, uh, you know, just out just out in the woods, or they would wash up on shore. And you know, some people would try to you know pass it off as like, well, it was a bear attack. But you know, when you actually you know had the medical examiners come in and look at it, it's like, well, there's no claw marks, so right. you know, it 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 wasn't a bear. And uh, yeah, so people became frightened, and you know the, uh, the the cannery ended up shutting down. It was a, it was a small village. Now it's a ghost town. You know, there's, there's right. nobody there now. Right. It essentially, was done by the 1950s. Right, but I heard also that even hunters, you know, after a while, they would. It was like you said, after dark, um, even hunters were like they were hesitant, and little by little, just people were refusing to live their life, for lack of a better word. Even though they had yeah. worked there, they just eventually just moved away and i think to myself you know that's i mean you could think well some people could be scared off but for a bunch uh basically a whole town that's that's has work there to often just for, forget it we're out of here that tells yeah, me we're that done. there had to be something going on yeah especially when you're talking about you know a, a fish cannery which i mean the fish industry there is yes. amazing it's, it's phenomenal and you you know with the huge salmon and all this stuff up there which is just it you know, it's delicious <laughs> uh, so it's a it's okay. a booming it's a booming staple up there and then all of a sudden you're you know yeah you like you said you're abandoning the the cannery which their business wise there's there's no reason why yeah there's no reason why to abandon it you know business wise because if the fishing is a huge industry up there but they're just getting scared off yeah let me ask you have you heard of something and i read about this in Alaska, something that's called a specter moose, okay, and supposedly it's uh, it's it's um, it's a moose that looks white, but it's not really white. It's uh, one of the, and it's not an albino. It's just born with uh, the fur is grayish, which makes it look white. And I think supposedly, and it's not a, a cryptid in the sense of like you know, but supposedly if you sight it, it's like a, a, a like if you see it, something bad's gonna happen. I don't know if you had come across that story. I had come across it very recently. Um, yeah, I, I've heard of stories like that before. I never encountered. Uh, right, and it's 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 apparently those. it's it's a rare animal in and of itself. So yeah. that supposedly when it's sighted, it's like oh oh. You know, I can't remember. Yeah, because it's so last... unusual. They, it's like a harbinger of of whatever. Right. So, I want to yeah. say there was a, one of the last times it was a while back, but it was right before some type of volcano. Something erupted there. It was like <laughs> it's like great timing. Yeah, but, when um, I first showed up to Alaska in the early '90s, Mount Spur had just erupted right over, right across the Cook Inlet from where I was stationed. So there was still like ash falling down out of the sky. Wow, <laughs> all kinds of crazy stuff. Let me tell you, up. that's. It doesn't, isn't that crazy? I don't know. You know, I've lived in Florida all my life and people say, how can you live in a place where you can get a hurricane? But I'm like, you know what? You at least can get leave if you want to. Right. But I'm thinking of these places with earthquakes and volcanoes. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> at, at least with a volcano, there are some signs that, you know, we're coming up to an eruption, but with an earthquake, you have no idea. No, no. And I, I experienced several while I was up there. Um, One of the things that also, and, and one of the, I want to say, you know, you hear all these stories about Bigfoot all over the United States. You know, every area has got some version of their Bigfoot or Sasquatch. But it seems like the ones in Alaska, for some reason, appear to be more aggressive or more, 
territorial. Like, in other words, if you cross paths with some of these, it's like, you know, I've heard of people like their cars being found and that's it. No more person. Yeah. Yeah. And it's especially like the hairy man is a more aggressive one. I mean, there's some just like regular, you know, standard mm-hmm. basic Sasquatch sightings, but others where, you know, there's some sort of like damage that's been done or, or what, what have you. And again, it, it is not attributed to something like a bear because there's, there's no claw marks or you end up with the big footprints and things like that as well. Do they have any of the, I was always curious because I'm always interested, you know, these uh, mining ghost towns and I know in Alaska, like in the Yukon, do they have any, um, I want to say ghost towns like that from any of the mining camps that used to be up there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the Killicott uh, copper mine was, um, you know, it was a huge mine like 100 years ago. Uh, you know, fantastic tales of how they had to build the railroad there because they're they're building the tracks across glaciers and the glaciers would wow. move. So they'd always have to go back and adjust the tracks. And they, you know you see some of those like crazy movies or cartoons where they have like the, the railroad tracks, like hanging right off the mountain like that. No, uh-huh. it, it was actually like that up there uh, for this copper mine to get, to get the, the goods wow. back and forth. And um, yeah, there are tales of the hauntings up there. One of the interesting ones is that the, uh, the headstones of the old, uh, of the old graveyard, like you'll, you can walk up the path to go visit the the ruins of the old mining town and you'll see the headstone mm-hmm. sitting there. And then as you walk back down, the headstones are gone. What? Yeah. <laughs> They're just disappearing okay. headstones. Yeah. So you, it's all kinds of interesting things like that. There, and you'll see like, you know, phantom rail cars and then, you know, some mm-hmm. of the miners and things like that. Like when they were putting up a housing development in that area, um, the, uh, the construction crew was reporting seeing the old miners. They would have tools go missing just okay, uh, yeah. right off right off his tool belt and things like that. Because mm-hmm. that's what I hear. You know, a lot of these mining camps, people, I mean, but people died. Talk, talk about violent death and sudden. That mining work was very dangerous in a lot of different ways. So in, in some cases, you have what they call that, uh, that recipe for an intelligent haunting where, you know, violent death on unex- well i don't want to say unexpected because obviously if you're a miner but still um and even amongst themselves some of these mining camps you were they were kind of brutal as far as uh you know people did away with each other you know for you know to stake a oh, claim yeah. things of that nature oh, um, yeah there were a lot a lot of those deaths up there were were unreported Absolutely. yes yes yeah but it's not like now that everybody knows everything that everybody's doing people would show up there from other parts of the country and oh, yeah. it, it was, just... uh, yeah, you, you had a lot of, uh, it was a very transient type of culture there, uh, especially like a hundred years ago, because like you mentioned with the, with the Yukon, um, you know, that was, it was, the Yukon's actually in Canada, but oh, I'm sorry, you have I... to, no, no, it's fine because it's right on the edge of Canada and Alaska, but people traveling there would come up the waterways into Alaska and then mm-hmm. move on in, into the Yukon area that way and so what would end up happening is so many stories like this it became like a wild west town but in the north so uh so prospectors would come in they'd stay at the old hotels and bordellos and things like that um you have these interesting stories of you know uh you know guy and his wife or guy and his girlfriend show up there he goes off you know to you try to strike it rich with the with the gold rush and the woman would stay behind, would run out of money, would end up having to work at the bordello. The gentleman would come back, find that his wife or girlfriend is not working the bordello. He'd murder her there. So you have all these hauntings oh, yes. there that are, yeah. and it, it's you, you see so many stories like that that are very very similar at all these different you know old inns and saloons and uh, hotels and things like that. Yeah, people don't realize if for women there was not much you could do and. As a matter of fact, uh, and, and they say that so, so many people stream from that. Sometimes you have people that you never knew their real names. Like they, let's say they were Red Eyed Tom, or whatever. You never knew really <laughs> what his true name was. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think even, and this was in the Yukon, Wyatt Earp even went out there when they struck gold and he had a mine out there called the Sore Finger. So when they, these places, people would come from all over. And, you know, there were the people that would make money from the miners, which is selling them stuff, but you had a lot of different people with different backgrounds and that's to put it nicely. And um, that's why I think a lot of these mining camps, uh, you know, it's inescapable that there's some type of haunting attached to them. But that one about the graveyard, 
It's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, you have so, a lot of interesting tales up there. Yes, you do. You do. The, um, they And they also have a, a thing going on with UFOs as well. It's like, wow. Oh, yeah, and yeah. A one. lot of UFO sightings up there. A lot of UFO sightings. So let me ask you, uh, I know that you've done uh, several books. Uh, what was the what was the last one that you that you uh, put out that you published? Yeah, the last one was Alaska's Mysterious Triangle. So on everything oh, okay. we were just talking okay. about, it came out back in October. So yeah, we just had uh, season two of the Alaska Triangle television show, which came out uh, beginning of September, and I was trying to hurry up and get that that book out uh, in time in the second season, which okay. I, I got it out in the middle of the season. So I was, I was happy to finally get that published, but, uh, yeah, Alaska's mysterious triangle. And then just before that was a walk in the shadows, a complete guide to shadow people and all the mm-hmm. shadow phenomena, which, uh, led to my docuseries, uh, the shadow dimension, which if anybody wants to to watch that and get like real in depth on shadow phenomena, that is, uh, running free on Tubi TV right now. On where? Tubi TV. On Tubi. Okay. Perfect. Mm-hmm. All right, so if they if they go on Tubi, what should they look for as far as to just look for, for the the shadow dimension, the shadow dimension. Okay, yep. okay, and well, and that Alaska Triangle that's almost equivalent a little bit like what I've heard, like to the Bermuda Triangle, where yeah. just weird stuff happens. People uh, and airplanes experience, from what I understand, their instruments going crazy, and that's where also they have a lot of these disappearances of planes and just. Yeah, 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 you end up with a lot of um, the strange, you know, missing airplanes, all kinds of crazy things going on with with ships up there. So, uh, yeah, you have these different triangle areas of of the world. Everybody's familiar with the Bermuda Triangle, mm-hmm. uh, Alaska Triangle's a big one. You have like uh, the Dragon Triangle out in Japan, which that one right by Japan uh, dates. That one dates, you know, far uh, far before you know, the Bermuda Triangle. Like you. The Bermuda Triangle, we coined that term back in the 1940s and, you know, it's strange and people have been, you know, noticing strange experiences there for, for decades and even as far back as like Christopher Columbus, but Dragon Triangle out there uh, near Japan, um, you had strange things going on out there as far back as, uh, you know, Kublai Khan, you know, the, the son of uh, Genghis Mm -hmm. Khan. So that far back where, you know, he had, he's bringing, you know, 40,000 troops through there for an invasion and just all of a sudden they all go down (laughs) right i I heard something that that's why they were unable to conquer japan basically yeah as far as what they intended to do yeah so uh, they had the the, the mongols had basically like swept all mm -hmm. of asia so yeah the uh the japanese government has actually back in the 1950s designated that area as basically no shipping zone you, you do not want to travel really? through there because of all the bizarre things that happen within that so yeah you have these different areas like that throughout the the world and uh in alaska you have this massive area with I mean, basically what's what it comes down to is the the magnetic properties within those within those areas say you have these uh vortices that develop so that uh you know welling up of energy from the earth's magnetic core and it spawns uh-huh. off you know it spawns off portals you have like you're talking about right. the instrumentation problems because of the the, the strange uh, magnetism that's going on there and in alaska it's even exacerb- exacerbated even more because the uh magnetic shielding of the earth is actually thinner up there which is why okay. you know you end up seeing the aurora borealis and things like that up there because of you know the solar the solar wind with the protons and electrons hitting off the ionosphere and the magnetic protection is thinner so you see all those wonderful colors but you know that's more uh you have more things interacting with the magnetism of the earth right there and so that you know, helps to to spur some things. That's why things like harp uh, mm-hmm. were built Something up like, there. Yeah, right. Do you, that you mentioned that that thing with a portal. Um, do you think that sometimes that accounts for like what you were talking about that runner that he just like just totally is gone and yeah, the, accounts for some of the disappearances. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, some of these people could be disappearing into to portals and other dimensions. Um, you know, one of the yeah, it's so many plane disappearing uh, planes mm-hmm. up there, but uh, one from 1950, which was a Douglas Skymaster, flies out of uh, out of Elmendorf Air Force Base, uh, and it's uh, you know 
pretty much a beautiful day, you know, a few scattered clouds, but uh, everything's going fine. And then all of a sudden, as it crosses the Canadian border, boom, it's gone. And you know, it was never found again. They ended up, you know, thousands and thousands of people out there, you know, scouring the land, um, mm-hmm. you know, all kinds of, you know, planes flying around trying to find where, you know, because they're thinking it crashed, it went down somewhere. Right. Um, but nothing. And there was even a, there was a smaller plane that went down in the same area, like weeks later, they were able to find that plane like that. But mm-hmm. here's this huge Douglas Skymaster, nothing. Where did it go? One of the interesting things is that, um, they did catch some garbled radio chatter not long after, which they think may have come from the Douglas Skymaster, uh, but they could never confirm it. So one of the running theories is that uh, the the plane disappeared into the portal or a right. portal uh, and the uh, radio chatter, because sound works on a different wavelength, was able to be heard coming through there, at least for a short period of time. Mm hmm. Right. And it makes so, you wonder, and, where did they end up at, huh? Right. Exactly. Where did they end up at? And that leads me into other ideas of things that go on in Alaska. So if if they went through a portal, where did they go? Sure, they could have gone into another dimension. They could have gone to another place in time as well. And so, okay. you know, let's say, OK, you know, if they went back in time, or they could go forward in time, too. Uh, but let's say they went back in time, uh, throw a number out there 500 years ago. Okay, we'll just say that that's our theoretical uh, idea. If that happened, what would that look like to the natives up there at that time? They see this huge Douglas Skymaster going overhead. It was very loud. Um, You know, it's got the it's got the exhaust and everything coming off of it. You know, to me, this could be some of our Thunderbird legends of old. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. You took the words out of my mouth. How would they don't. Like you said, we're talking 500. They don't they don't understand something mechanical. They're immediately right. going to assume that it's an animal or a monster or something. Exactly. Yeah, it's completely out of context for them. It's in the air. You know, there yeah. are large birds. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, perhaps it becomes you know, some of these different Thunderbird legends. Maybe that's where some of them come from. Right. And that makes you think, you know, do they assimilate and have to live out their days 500 years before? Uh, yeah, it's, are, it's, we gonna, are we eventually going to find them under the ice and th- the dating of it's going to be really weird because it's like, wait a minute, these are yeah, the guys from somebody does a DNA sample <laughs> and yeah. they're like, hey, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah the the um, uh, it's it's incredible and and you know because of the the the, the freezing temperatures there, corpses I, I from what I understand they get preserved very well for a very long time. They can. Yeah. It's, it's really fascinating. They will find, you know, um, they will find, you know, ancient natives up there, you know, almost like mummified in the ice. Uh-huh. Uh, they'll find, they'll find the animals up there, like the woolly mammoths. Uh, they'll find right. those, those mammoths whole up there in the ice. And they're actually talking about bringing back the woolly mammoths. I know. I heard that, that they had found yeah. some so fresh, I guess you want that they were thinking, you know, cloning it or, you know, yeah, something like a Jurassic Park scenario kind of thing. It's kind of a Jurassic Park scenario. They have to, because the, the DNA is broken down enough where they can't completely clone a woolly mammoth, mm-hmm. but they're talking about crossing it with some elephant DNA. Right. And so there's this real strange mix in the scientific community where, you know, some people are like, you know, let's do it. Let's bring back the woolly mammoths. And others are like, well, it's not really going to be a true woolly mammoth. It's going to be, mm-hmm. you know, this hairy elephant with some extra fat deposits. So right. it's you... like, and it's time came and went and it's, yeah. and it's not and, like well, you have enough some... specimens that you can't study it. Yeah. And, and some of them are also saying, well, you know, there's a reason why the woolly mammoths died out. If, you know, we reintroduce that, you know, them into the environment is whatever, you know, killed them off the first time. Is that still within those DNA strands exactly. and we'll just do the same thing again. So, right. I don't and know, you, but there's also people you know. who believe. Go yeah. Ahead. And, and there's, there's some people who also believe that there are some woolly mammoths still out there in the wild, in the wilderness, you know, uh, Alaska's massive. There are, there are areas of that that we truly have not, explored yet because the state is so massive and so it's almost like you know with with sasquatch you know the Mm -hmm. idea of there are small pockets of them you know out there in the wilderness and so some people believe that the woolly mammoth 
uh, may also have some small pockets out there. And so I, I threw the question out there uh, in uh, my Alaska Triangle book, Alaska's Mysterious right. Triangle. So what happens if we reintroduce, you know, our hybridized, you know, woolly mammoth into, you know, the environment and there are some other, you know, true woolly mammoths out there and they breed, what are we going to end up with? <laughs> Well, I've even heard that they they have belief that even dire wolves that there's belief that there's some, mm-hmm. of course, very remote areas always. Yeah. Uh, and I hear also in Siberia and Russia they always find some weird stuff every once in a while under their you know because they're I think they're frozen what all the time. Um, yeah. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised. And but then you think about it, elephants, modern elephants, they're now they exist in very hot, humid temperatures. That's their natural environment. Whereas these animals were basically living in an ice age. So how well is it going to, you know, it'd be a weird, but still, you know, there's always, I think there's all of us after Jurassic Park, there's people like are wondering what if, you know, what will become, what will happen? Yeah, it's, it's that whole, just because we can, doesn't mean we should, but right. You know, there, I think there's something to be learned from, the process of learning how genetics Mm -hmm. work, because at at some point we're going to have to, and I I know this scares people, but at some point we're going to have to look into how do we modify ourselves for things like space travel, Uh, because we're eventually going to have to stretch out into the universe because this planet is not always going to be here. And that's not just in the sense of, you know, humans doing things to destroy it. At some point the the sun is going to become a red giant and, you know, destroy the planet. I mean, sure, it's uh-huh. not going to be for billions of years, but it is going to happen. So at some point we need to stretch out into the universe. And so we might need to look into how might we end up needing to change our genetics to, you know, have extended right. space travel, live on another planet and things like that. So yeah, there's something, something to be learned different from the gravity process. pools. Let's say, yeah, let's go exactly. with Mars. Mars is the closest thing, mm-hmm. you know, as far as you know, even though we're discovering a lot of different things, but yes, I understand him. Even though, you know, I have heard the dark side of this is like you hear, um, uh, you know, these labs with the CRISPRs and uh, tweaking genetics. And I've even heard of human animal hybrids. You know, you don't know how much truth is it, or is this just like somebody thinking, oh, there's a mad scientist in the lab going, whoa, you know, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, I'm going to try to make yeah, a, you know, Island of Dr. Moreau kind of thing. Right, right. There's already interesting things that they're doing, like, um, if you can believe this, crossing uh, spider DNA with goats so that within goat milk, there are, with goats, goats, yeah, goats, yeah, so that in the, in the goat milk, they, they actually get the, the silk from, uh, from, oh. from the spiders in, in their spider webs, and it, it creates a very high tensile uh, type of material, um, so, that's We're already hard. doing crazy things like that. Yeah. Uh, this was a few, I want to say like maybe three or four years ago. One time I was talking to a priest and the conversation came up because there's a university next to, I went to a Catholic high school and it's a Catholic university. And we got to talking because I hadn't been by there for a while and he teaches there and he tells me, no, I'm teaching bioethics. And I said, yeah, hmm. well, what is that about? And he goes, well, that's about things that people shouldn't do just because they can. And he was basically yeah. talking about the medical, you know, genetic stuff, mm-hmm. you know, like things that even if you can, you shouldn't ethically. And I said, right. but does that really happen? He goes, not in this country, but there's a lot of labs in other countries where they don't have, you know, they don't like look over your shoulder so much where, yeah, they're doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing with the genetics and animals and animal human, you know, kind of like, let's see what happens if we do that. I was like, Oh God. I don't know. That's, you know, you, you, you hear that yeah. and you're thinking always it's just science fiction, but unfortunately sometimes there's more to it than that. No, there are, there are people out there in this world in their own, you know, secret labs doing things like that. Yep. Yes. Yes, exactly. 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 And then, you know, we'll go, we could go in the other direction and, you know, as far as uh, robotics and humans, and that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother show. But yeah, a know, lot of that is coming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me ask you with the, um, with the, uh, as far as the, uh, the, the ghost stories, I know, um, are you doing any stuff, anything local to where you're at right now? As far as uh, any well, sites have, that you've been going to? 
Yeah, I mean, I have uh, you know, different events that I do. I mean, it's right now it's the middle of winter, so oh, <laughs> I'm really sorry. getting out right. anywhere. Nah. Um, but yeah, you know, I have right right down the uh, road is you know the the site that the I mean, Ohio is a pretty haunted city. We got we got stuff all over the place, but you know, a favorite of mine right down the road is the the site that's known as the quote unquote Gore Orphanage, which um, okay, you know, it, it the urban legend is that. Um, you know, there was an orphanage wrote, run by old man Gore and, you know, he was very mean. He locked the kids in at night. And one day, uh, the, the place caught on fire. He left them locked in their rooms while he ran out and they all died. Um, which is not true. <laughs> that's the urban legend. I was about to ask you, is there any truth to this? I know a lot of these things when you the, research them, it's like, man, it's yeah, totally it's, fabricated. It, there are elements of it that are pulled from different areas to kind of create this thing. So the, the building in question was actually never an orphanage. It was, it was known as the, the Swift mansion. Um, it was a, you know, very beautiful home kind of, you know, uh, down in this ravine along the, the river. Uh, and it became abandoned in the late 1800s, built in the 1860s by, uh, uh, my very wealthy investor. He ended up losing oh his God. money. Wait a minute. The Gore mansion. Wait, keep going. Cause I want to tell you a ghost story. Okay. I heard all of a sudden when sure. you said Gore, I was like, wait a minute, but keep going. Yes. Okay. So he ended up losing his money. They sold it to another okay. family. Um, there was a, a tragedy there with that particular family in which, um, the, the grandchildren, uh, had, had all, um, died within a, a few days with, of each other with diphtheria like within the span of seven oh, days all four of the grandchildren God, yeah. had passed away um the the grandmother is the grandparents that lived at the house the children didn't actually live there uh, okay. but the uh the woman of the house the grandmother she basically lost it when that happened and so she she was in into spiritualism so she had some seances and things like that at the house she started putting out place settings for the grandchildren things like that uh, a few years down the road, uh, they moved from there. The house became abandoned. Nobody else moved into it. This is the okay. late 1890s. It was years later, almost 10 years later, that up the hill, the Orphanage of Light and Hope uh, came into being. And so that's where the orphanage was. It was not actually this building. Oh, so they, they actually... kind of like, oh, I see. Yeah, so it's like you're starting to see it's starting to merge together here. So they did own the land in the house where, you know, of that Swift mansion, but mm -hmm. they didn't use it for anything. Um, they they wanted the field back behind there for farming. The, the kids, I imagine, played within there uh, because, you know, you have to pass by it up and down the hill all the time. So of course they're probably going to go inside and play around at some point. Um, right. but they lived, they lived in um, the buildings up the hill. Now the, uh, the people who ran the orphanage, the Sprungers, they were very mean. Uh, they were actually brought to trial for the abuses that really? they put on the children. Yeah. And that orphanage eventually was shut down in 1916. All the while down below, uh, along the river, that old mansion is still there. Um, it did actually burn down uh, in 1921. Uh, it was it been abandoned for you know 25 years. <laughs> you know nobody was in it at the time. Children did not perish or die within it. Um, okay. Now there was a a fire you know, around that time within a few years, uh, sort of in the area, the Collinwood Fire, which was a school. And okay. back then we didn't have fire regulation. So there was really one, only one exit for them to try to get out of the building. It was really sad because um, it was, uh, it was over a hundred children who perished in that fire. I think it was like oh 172 or something like that, if I recall correctly. Um, so yeah, it was a very, very tragic with all these children that, that perished in this fire Yeah, sort of in the area. So it's, Okay. Mike, if you can hear me, I can't hear you. You froze on me, darn it. Let's see. I see you. Okay. okay. Can you hear All right, me? keep going. Okay. You're back. 
where okay where did that leave off before you, the, off? uh the kids uh, a bunch of kids they died like 70 something yeah, children the, died in the fire yeah it was like 172 children died in in the fire the Collinwood school fire which was sort of in the area around that time so you kind of see all these different elements that come together to create this story of this abandoned building um and so you know over the years this legend grew up uh, one of the things that kind of hurt or kind of aided in the story is that the road along there is called Gore Orphanage Road, but oh. it was never called Gore Orphanage. the The problem is that the road was originally named Gore Road, and uh, okay. it, when the orphanage up the hill, the Orphanage of Light and Hope, came into being, they just appended the name orphanage onto it, so that people that were familiar with Gore Road know it's Gore Road. People that were looking for the orphanage knew this was the road to go to the orphanage, but over time, people just thought it, it must have been named Gore Orphanage, but it never was. <laughs> and, you know, because people don't realize people, you know, back then people, they that's the way they named it. it was nothing. It was an official. It was like, yeah, you know, Gore Orphanage were there. Yeah. Before yeah, you know it. That's it's Gore, not, it's, yeah. The orphanage is there down Gore, Gore Road. So it just. Yeah. They mishmashed that's, it together. That's, you know, that the orphanage, what was it? The name the orphanage of light and hope. God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the orphanage light and hope, which was not because they were no. Very I was abusive. like, man, if let me tell you something for for an orphanage back then to be shut down, it must have been horrific. Oh, because... it was. Yeah, they were having like fifteen kids use the same bath water. Um, the yeah, the the types of food that they were eating was just like horrific, and you know, because they they were malnourished and uh, mm -hmm. just just crazy stuff. So yeah, it was terrible. Now, by the way, I just remembered the Gore Mansion, which I'm thinking about. It's in Massachusetts. That's why I was going Gore, Gore, Gore. Oh, okay, okay. And it was like, no, I was like, no, this doesn't sound right. And they have one in Massachusetts where there was a sighting. There was a pond. It's a haunted pond. And I was going to ask you, hey, is there a haunted pond there? That it uh, back in the 1890s, there was they were doing work, and part of the work the workmen had to do was drag the pond. Supposedly, they saw uh, an. an an owner that was dead come out of the boathouse and row his rowboat. Oh wow! On the pond, and a bunch of workmen quit. So they got another bunch, and they kind of like didn't hear the story. And the second ones quit because they saw the same thing. So it's uh yeah, things like that. Well, it makes you wonder what was he doing out there in the middle of the pond? Yeah, really. But uh, I'll I'll tell you how this is how abusive the Gore orphanage was. Uh, there was one boy who managed to to run away, and okay. um, when they put him on on the stand because he he was called on to testify, uh, he said that he ran away to get an education because they weren't teaching him any there. Now imagine that somebody runs away so that they can a kid runs away so he can go to school. What ki what kid runs to school? <laughs> yeah, because they they that that says volumes. You yeah. know, because a lot of, uh, there was a, even if it wasn't government sponsored, a lot of charities would give to these orphanages, you know, like women's groups, everybody felt sorry for orphans. So God knows how much money they were taking in and obviously not using it for the kids and uh, people. That's what I'm saying. It, you hear about some orphanages that were pretty bad, but they still, they left them alone because at the end of the day, people saw it as, okay, they're taking these orphans in. So right. for an orphanage to actually be shut down, that speaks volumes, right? And in those years is what I'm saying. Yeah, Back in those yeah, years where, yeah. you know, uh, it's not like now where it was like, okay, well, poor kid, you know, he's an orphan or whatever. You know, just like those poor farms that they had where, yep. you know, if, for whatever reason, you didn't have a place to live, you would end up there. Oh, uh, Yeah, at an almshouse or a poor farmer or what have you, yeah. That, so let me ask you, so... What's you, you said the orphanage burnt down, but the Gore yeah, house so, is still there. Yeah. Um, the, uh, well, the, the Swift mansion down there at the, at, at along the river, there are burned down. Okay. Um, and okay. the, the buildings from the orphanage, there's, I know that the, um, the one little, one little building is still there. Um, uh, the others are, are, pretty much gone there's a couple of the interesting thing is right this one house is at the top of the hill where the boys dormitory used to be and they okay. knocked that down built another house there they have a couple of pillars along the driveway which we were actually dragged up 
from the Swift Mansion because I have old photos of that mansion. Here are these, you know, basically pillars that go like along the side of the driveway or whatever, kind of mark the property. Okay. And they're actually up the hill now. So at some point, those kids were asked to to drag that up there. Um, but the the ruins of the mansion are still there. Like you can go there. The foundation is still there. Um, mm -hmm. you know, some of the old tiles, the old well is still there. Um, so that's kind of, you You can go down into that area. And if you know who it is, you're actually trying to, to talk to, which would be, mm -hmm. um, the, the Swift family or the Wilbur family, who's, which is the name of the family that moved in, uh, right. after the fact. If, if you go down there to talk to them, you can get some interesting uh, interaction there uh, around that old foundation. Oh, really? mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, what do people go out there, try to what uh, do EVPs or just capture stuff or, or what? Yeah, yeah, they'll do a lot of stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, you get a lot of kids that go down there and, you know, drink yeah. and. You know, yes, I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah, you get your regular legend trippers or, you know, and mm -hmm. then you have. Uh, and do people report anything having to do with, with children? Well, yeah, that's where the, cause some of the crazy legends come into place is people say, oh, I saw a child running around on fire, which goes back to the. Old, <laughs> <you know>? OK, <laughs> like, no, um, no, they don't really get the children down there. Um, OK, you know, who you'll who you'll get down there is like the uh basically like the wilbur family if it the um the, the grandmother who kind of you know lost right you know, lost her mind a little when bit there when she had um, all the kids die all right yeah yeah when her when her grandchildren died um yeah so you you can get some interaction with her and a couple of others okay. from from the family yeah interesting so interesting. When, and what is interesting um you will get like a lot of footsteps around that area so like you know people walking in and around the foundation mm -hmm. area so that's pretty interesting. Right. You know, but, it, and I tell people sometimes these places are interesting to go to, but it's really difficult. I don't know how, how popular it is, but if you've got other people walking around with too much ambient noise, you know, you kind of lose any chance of getting anything that, you know, was that noise? Was that, you know, somebody yeah, walking around is, on the other side or? Right. Unfortunately, this, this area is a lot, a lot more quiet because it's, it's okay. actually part of a park. So. Oh, um, okay. It's. Yeah. So the grounds around it are part of a park. Interesting. Yeah, the grounds around it are part of part of a park. I mean, there are people, you know, down along the river. Normally, by the one bridge was a bit down the road. Uh, there'll be some guys fishing down there, um, and then up the road, which I, I I keep saying, you know, up the hill. Up the, it's it's an abandoned road. They okay. Um, they blocked off the road to get from the top of the hill down because um, there was a huge storm during the 1960s that. Um, okay that basically damaged the roads kind of falling in, you know, down the hill into the, into the river. And they just decided not to repair it because it was going to cost too much in maintenance. So uh, when you walk up there, it's, it's really like kind of walking along the side of the cliff because okay. half the road is gone. It's down the hill. Uh, you get the old guardrail is down there. <laughs> You're like, Hey, there's really? a guardrail down there. Yeah. So okay. that's kind of crazy. Uh, but and again, it's another, it's another thing with, you know, crazy urban legends where um uh you know the, the story is that they uh they blocked off the road because you know kids that were drinking down there at the at the old at the old ruins were uh terrorizing motorists <laughs> so <laughs> they you know what anything is possible but you know what you know why i asked you that mike because sometimes people um that live in a local in an area lo know about the local uh haunted places you know stuff that you don't hear about unless you speak to somebody that lives in that area yeah well and that's because, what i did um you know because I, I i'd go out there quite a bit i'm posting you know videos and things like that on my youtube channel um uh -huh. and so i was getting in touch with you know a number of the locals that had lived there a while or people that had done some of the research into it we kind of you know had some back and forth and um you know and that's where i started getting some of the uh, information about well no that that road was closed down because of, of the storm you know it was it was a wild storm it was uh you talked about you know hurricanes earlier um right. it was you know i mean we're, we're off of you know we're in ohio we don't get hurricanes here but uh, we do have lake erie up there and okay yes. it was um fourth of july back in the 1960s i want to say 67 or 68 uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh it was a massive storm that suddenly came up out of nowhere off the lake 
And uh, the, the winds had gotten so fierce that, you know, people that were down at the park waiting for the, uh, you know, the, the fireworks and everything to go off, they were actually being picked up off the ground because of this wind. So it's just, it ruined that 4th of July. And it was that storm that damaged that road, uh, that, that part of Gore Orphanage Road that has been shut down ever since. Because, yeah, people don't realize that sometimes, you know, I know what you're saying. Everybody thinks of like hurricanes or tornadoes as being destructive, but you can get, if you get a bad enough storm, it will like do that type of, uh, mm-hmm. that type of damage. And um, back in 2000, where have you ever heard of this? I want to say like 2000, God, it was 2008, 2009. I went to Marblehead over there in Sandusky, right mm-hmm. on the lake. And they had a place where they used to have a civil war prison for Southern prisoners. Uh, God, what's the name of it? Now I can't remember. Now, I was wondering if you had ever heard of it because they, was, they were saying there were hauntings there because they kept Confederate soldiers there as prisoners. And the last yeah. I heard was they had, um, you know how they keep like uh, roles of who's being kept prisoners. Right. But at one yeah. point, they did like, a, you know, they uh, basically go over the ground and they found so many other graves beyond the borders of the s- cementary for the prisoners. Mm-hmm. But they were saying that there was, a, you know, a lot of the records. In other words, it didn't tally up with yeah. supposedly the ones that were buried versus who was there. Yeah, you don't know. A lot of those records are really incomplete. And yeah, they, they were not giving the right numbers back then. Right, right. And, and a lot of people, and it's surprising because people don't, you know, um, people are very familiar with the one in Georgia, which I think it was uh, Andersonville, you know, it's one of the Civil War, right. you know, uh, prisoner camps. But this one in Ohio, I was surprised and not till I went there and they had the uh, the cemetery. Was I aware that they had this uh you know, the, the other, on the other way where they kept Confederate prisoners. And of course, you know, like you said, the winters there were so harsh and they kept a lot of them, you know, under, they weren't kept warm. How's that? Right. And, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, something... a lot of those guys perished and, yeah. you know, an, another interesting, uh, prison was there in Alton, Illinois, which I've been around that area, done a lot of research in that area for, uh, several years. And, the prison that was used there for the civil war well they had they, they had a, a smallpox epidemic and so okay. there was this island out in the mississippi river that um it was called a lot of different things mosquito island because it got a lot of mosquito sunflower island because there were a lot of sunflowers on there and they ended up also calling it smallpox island because they quarantined the smallpox uh mm-hmm. the, the people that contracted smallpox onto that island from the prison when they died they buried them on the island well Years later, they wanted to put in a dam right there and they were, you know, they obliterated the island, forgetting about all the people that were buried there. And they ended up digging all these bodies up. And for years, you know, people downstream, just like, you know, guys fishing off the Mm -hmm. river, they're all of a sudden, you know, you know, a bone or a skull or whatever would suddenly pop up for years later. Um, so I can imagine, Hey, I've got something on my line. Wait. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, is there, there's a monument there now, but it's like, yes. Yeah. But what do you do with all the bones? With, um, you know, when you have a, like a pestilence, you were lucky if you got buried. They had a lot of those mass burial sites. There was no, it was just, you know, people were afraid of contagion with good reason. So they, they they were quick to bury people and there was no, it was just put them in there, you know, dig a pit and, Put them in there and Just bury them in, because yeah. it was a lethal disease back then. And yeah. uh, I heard there's uh, one of those. Uh, what was it? North Brother, uh, North Brother Island over there, and right next to New York, had something similar along the same lines. Where at some point they were sending uh, people that were contagious, like uh, Typhoid Mary, was kept over there. Oh, okay. same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, because you know y- you had you needed a ferry basically to get off the island. And, uh, you know, they, they, they said, yeah, there were some burials that were, you know, they were logged. And then there were mm-hmm. others that was like, you know, things like that. So, yeah, a lot of those places that I would say that, that, that there's a good chance that there's some type of haunting going on or at least something interesting that you could pick up on. Oh, for sure. So what projects do you have planned for 2022? 
2022, uh, I have a lot of things going on. Right now, I'm finishing up on the audiobook for Alaska's Mysterious Triangle. So that'll be out on audio here pretty soon. Then I have to, uh, right now on audio, I have the first edition for A Walk in the Shadows that's out. I have a second edition of the written book. I need to do the audio book for that. So that'll be after I finish the audio book for Alaska's mysterious triangle. Uh, the shadow dimension is getting into season two. So okay. um, that is a project that is underway. We also have a uh, uh, ancient mysteries of Ireland tour coming up in July. We only have four tickets left. Wow. Uh, okay, folks, yeah. if you're hearing this, go for it quick. Yeah, it's July 1st through the 9th. So yes. you want to jump on that because, again, only four tickets left. So we're we're doing a lot of different uh, haunted castles. And we're doing oh, wow. um, the, the different stone circles. Um, got some haunted distilleries in there. So, yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Can you imagine pub crawling? Yeah, and, and speaking of, yeah, it's going to be amazing. Speaking of uh, prisons, we also have for an entire night just to ourselves – spike island which is basically um ireland's alcatraz and so we have that whole island the whole oh prison God. to ourselves for a night yeah what where do people go to find out about this trip oh um, so you can go to my website right now you'll see the banner on the side there for okay. uh uh our uh, ancient mysteries of ireland and that'll okay. take you to all the information how to sign up and all that stuff all right and for my podcast listeners your website even though i'll put in the credits of the show yeah, mike you know, ricksecker.com okay all right and so there they they can jump they've got a link where they could jump and yep that sounds like a fabulous trip and i'm telling everybody july is around the corner everybody thinks no you don't have time it's gonna you come up quick time. it is it is mike it has been wonderful to speak to you i am let me tell you something. It definitely sounds like you've been a busy guy and you're going to stay a busy guy. And let me tell you <laughs> oh, that, for sure, that yeah. trip to Ireland. I got to have you come back because I imagine that's going to be really interesting. This, no, it's it's inevitable. Somebody's going to have to have some type of experiences. Oh, there are definitely oh experiences. I mean, we're, you know, Lep Castle, we're doing an investigation <gasps> at. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That, that, that Lep Castle, believe it or not, that non-human whatever it is running around there elemental it's like, like elemental what yeah, yeah. what we'll, we'll, i mean because yeah, i we'll, we'll get, we'll get the load down on the that thing for a long time yeah all right years of years <laughs> yes but even as far as like they've even had like even like uh uh in the 1920s and 30s people that supposedly they were having weird encounters with whatever that thing is which is god it's a sheep whatever uh, something crazy yeah oh that is great again thank you so much mike it has been Thanks, absolutely Marlene. wonderful to speak to you take care happy new year and the best of luck on all your projects happy new year take care bye-bye bye-bye wow wow jeez oh that last that last one <clears throat> That sounds like a great trip. Wow. See, that's the kind of stuff that you like. You take up a camera, a backup camera, a backup to the backup camera. All right. Lots of batteries, lots of things. I mean, this is like, I'll just pack jeans, t-shirts, a jacket, but plenty of recording, whatever it is you've got going on. Because there's got to be plenty there. And oh, and, and a lot of uh, micro cards, SD micros and whatever, memory sticks, whatever. It's something to hold all your stuff in. It's like, next. Wow. That's a great trip. Let me tell you something. See, um, before we started rolling, I told them, you know, you know, you always hear stuff going on in Alaska. But back in, was it 2018, I had spoken to a gentleman by the name of Bijorn Dila. As a matter of fact, you've seen him in some of the shows having to do with Alaska. And what he does um, was he, if people want to take a hunting trip or go out there, he's not a, like a, not a scout or a tracker, but basically he takes you out there. And he was the first one that started telling me some of these stories that I was like, all this is going on in Alaska. That's really out there. And he confirmed, um, you know, he spoke some about some of the things, but yeah, Alaska is very unusual. I mean, it's got everything, you name it. Disappearances, weird animals, Sasquatch, UFOs, um, 
And like you said, uh, some of these, if you look at the percentage of people that disappear or go missing, it's weird. Like you said, this is not uh, a well-populated state. It's not. So if you look at the, the proportions, and I know that they say sometimes they have found, let's say, uh, aircrafts, uh, they'll find them some, sometimes they have found them years after the fact. Um, and then others, they're never heard of again. And some of them I've, I've heard also that um, they're never found because the area that they went down in was very inaccessible as far as for, um, you know, any group that was going out there, any volunteers, search groups. And sometimes depending, you know, they don't really have a good idea exactly where it went down in, but still there's a lot of them that nothing, nothing hide nor hair is ever found of a human. There's no wreckage. Same thing also with the, uh, I've heard with a lot of the waterways, the rivers, streams, the uh, shorelines, uh, a lot of unusual cryptid, you know, like, and that one, that uh, Port Luck, uh, where they, uh, this was a little bit after the turn of the century, and this was like a thriving community built, the economy was built around the cannery. So everybody had a job. And it ended up getting abandoned because uh, people were disappearing. And you say, well, okay. But like he said, there were some that were eventually found and it's like, like a body parts or like rip part, you know, like it was like, and then, you know, once that takes on a life of its own, little by little, I want to say the, uh, if I read it correctly, um, I think it was like in the 1940s or 1950s, like uh, 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 the, the, how do you call it? The last uh, person that I think was manning the, the post office. Uh, and then that was it. That was the, the end of the, of the, of the, uh, because, you know, there's always the die hard um, before they finally said, okay, and now it's just a ghost town. And um, yeah, it's, that's right. It's on the Kenai Peninsula. And um, yeah, it was, it was right at 19, right at the turn of the century when it got uh, established and it's basically, it was, uh, it was like, it was on a bay and it was thriving, you know? Uh, and uh, from what I understand, uh, even, even after the, and after the, um, you know, the people had moved away and basically there was nobody there, even hunters that were in that area, just hunting, they were describing having weird experiences, um, you know, being chased by a creature as in some type of Bigfoot uh, or what they call a bipedal creature. Uh, you know, other people <clears throat> that were staying in, you know, camping or hunting, same thing, something going through their camp. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't just strictly to the people that were living there. So it's almost like, um, like whatever lived in that area territorial uh, stayed there, stayed there. And I think the, 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 the most disconcerting thing is that this was not your typical um, Bigfoot encounter where, you know, you see something run off or, or you hear snapping of branches or something like that, or maybe a call. This thing was aggressive. It was aggressive. Aggressive and sounded bloodthirsty. Uh, let me tell you something. For, to empty out a town that was thriving, already had a post office, <clears throat> was um, everybody was employed. All right. Uh, that right there tells you that there's a lot of weird stuff that was going on there. So, yeah, that's what you hear in a lot of these little areas uh, in, in Alaska. And, of course, the what he was talking about, like the, the Alaska Triangle. And I mean, when I grew up in Florida, the Bermuda Triangle, of course, you hear all those stories. And if I remember correctly, I think, and I'm not sure about this, but somebody told me that if you took the Bermuda Triangle, 
the one that's here off the coast of Florida, that one of the touch points is Miami. Basically, the Dragon Triangle, the one that's by Japan, is basically, it's on this, like if you went through the Earth and you took that triangle, it's on the same opposite side of the Earth where the Bermuda Triangle is at. I don't know how accurate that is because I, I read or heard about it. This was a while back. But I remember that that was one of the first times I had heard about that area off Japan. And that basically it was on the opposite side of the world where the Bermuda Triangle was at. You know, and a lot of people could say, and what, what's what's up with the triangle thing? You know, hmm? as in pyramid shape, as in, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's very unusual sometimes when you hear, um, you know, that uh, you could say, well, is it a coincidence? And also, believe it or not, there's a hypothesis um, where they believe that what, how can I say this? Where Atlantis used to be is right there, very, very close to where the Bermuda Triangle is, basically off the coast of Cuba. And that uh, even um, that there have been, and I'm sure some people have seen that there was a sighting off Bimini where they had seen what they thought were what was a, uh, either a road or a wall. I can't remember, but it was, and then there was some back and forth uh, about whether it was man-made or where it was something done by the tides. But I can attest to it because I've been in that area over there. The water, depending on the water is very, very clear. And I think somebody, the first time they saw it was in a plane, in a small plane. And um, it makes you wonder, you know, if there's any truth to Atlantis being in that area close by, you know, as far as there still being some type of ruins there, you know, were they dabbling or how can I say it? Was Atlantis made close to one of these magnetic centers because of maybe use of portals? Well, let's go there. Why not? Or was it the other way around? Was it something that they constructed uh, maybe some type of, how can I say it, uh, invention, something that, that got away from them as far as, you know, when you create something and the next thing you know, it's you've ripped a portal, uh, a magnetics, whatever, and th there goes Atlantis. I mean, why not? As far as the um, the that thing about the uh, that that chamber, that was found underneath his sphinx. And I knew I had to look at this. This was this uh, was published the day right before Christmas. Okay. And basically what it's saying is that a renowned Egyptologist has said that a man-made chamber has been discovered below the great sphinx in Egypt after a scan using new technology uncovered a void below the surface. Dr. Seifazde has made the claim after his team used non-invasive techniques to map the underneath of the famous monument. Um, they said that they found different areas of interest, but that the main section measuring 12 meters by nine meters sits about five meters under the surface below the Sphinx. All right. Uh, that's very interesting. And uh, the, I don't know what they call voids. I don't know if they're thinking, this is, is this a chamber or is this just a, a hole? Uh, and this is one of these voids we believe is the most likely candidate for the Hall of Records. And the legend is that the Hall of Records is popular uh, with people who hold alternative theories of ancient Egypt, although no physical evidence has been found to date. The idea of an ancient library underneath the Great Sphinx was first coined by American clairvoyant Edgar Casey and soon gained traction. Um, and he basically... Uh, and, and and I had heard that thing about the Hall of Records before as far as, as a matter of fact, Casey also pointed at that area off the coast of Cuba as being uh, where Atlantis or the ruins of Atlantis were situated. Um, he says uh, the researchers don't think if, if there's something there uh, he, because they think that it's likely full of water because the groundwater level comes up to about five meters. Um and they think that the archive was breached. In other words, it's not sealed. Uh, and that the contents were removed and ended up in Hermopolis in Me Middle Egypt. 
All right, we'll see what comes of that. Um, and, uh, you know, could those records have been found and moved? Are they still there? And if they're still there, would they ever say, yeah, we found evidence of Edgar Casey's prophetic dreams or visions. We've actually found them. Hmm? Would they ever talk about it, you think? Would they ever say, yeah, we found it? Or, hmm, let's see. Which way do you think you could go? The Egyptian government could keep it, which, of course, it's part of Egyptian history. Or do you think that some private collector, just on the possibility, is is, is um, making some type of uh, quick, like, a hey, if there is any truth to that, I am willing to offer X, X, X amount for whatever's there. Ah, it's, and um, let me see, just for people that are not familiar with what the Hall of Records is, as far as believe it or not, because everybody thinks, okay, besides the fact that you find a chamber under the Sphinx, which is, you know, I, I know that there's even controversy of how old the Sphinx actually is, okay? Um, you know, you know, because I, I've heard that the they said it because of the, what was it? the way the, the rain or the water had been that it says that it was actually uh, is much older than what people thought. Mm, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes I want to say, I want to say sometimes academics, if they've put out a theory as far as age or, you know, this was used for that. Sometimes they have, a problem backtracking and saying, no, we were wrong. Okay. Now, uh, supposedly the story of the Hall of Records begins with Atlantis. And the story goes that it, near the end of days, the Atlanteans, um, basically what, what I guess the this is according to the reading given by Casey, says there came the first egress of people to the Pyrenees and into what later became the Egyptian dynasties. All right, and of course it talks about the, the the eruptions and things of I guess basically it sounds like a some type of cataclysmic event. Uh, and he says the people that left uh, they took record to the movements of stars and constellations. All right, and um, in those periods when the first change had come in the position of the land, there had been an egress of peoples from the Atlantean land and they built a city near the edge of the Sahara. All right. So, I mean, that's very interesting, isn't it? And I know there's a lot of mystery schools out there which are built around the belief of either knowledge passed on from the Atlanteans God, so much. In other words, that they believe that uh, as far as ancient civilizations, there's much older civilizations of what you traditionally think of, you know, that you say oh, ancient civilizations along the Tigris and the Euphrates and, you know, Persia and all these things. But they're saying that there was older civilizations. Is that true? Isn't that? Hmm. Interesting. We'll see what comes of that. I'm going to follow up on that. Again, guys, thank you for being part of my audience. Come back every week. I have a lot of great guests lined up. All right. Also, don't forget, um, you can go to my website and you can either find video links for any of the shows if you want to look at it on a video, in other words, a video version. Um, or if you want to just listen to the podcast, I've got links to different podcast platforms and I've got links that will take you to where you can either listen to the MP3 file from the browser or you can download the MP3 file without commercial interruption. All right. Either way. And I, I not only do I have it for stories of the supernatural, I also have it for nightshade diary and also for supernatural story time. All right. You can go to nightshadediary.com or supernaturalstorytime.com. But all that information, you're going to find links to it from MiamiGhostChronicles.com, whatever the case might be. Again, I want to urge 
anybody has suggestions for guest topics or hopefully you have your own unusual story that you'd like to pass along to me, I welcome it. You want to leave your name? Fine. If you don't want to, that's fine. Uh, or, you know, if you what's that saying about that show? Names have been changed to protect the, the innocent or whatever, or sometimes even the guilty, whatever the case might be. You know what? Anything like that. Uh, also, I tell people it doesn't have to be. It could be a second or third hand recounting. It didn't have to be you that experienced it. Maybe it's a family thing. I'm um, even looking, you know, if you've got strange tales of, uh, you know, true crime, things like that, that, you know, hey, you know, my town, there was a story going around, blah, blah, blah. I, I'd love to hear that as well. So, again, guys, take care. Uh, hopefully this will be a wonderful year for all of us. And and that's what at least what I'm hoping for. And please come back next week because I've got a lot of interesting topics and guests that I'm sure that you're going to enjoy listening to.